In this session, I will introduce the contemporary history of the Kaaba recorded by the scholars, historians, and the religious leaders. Note, some content may not be suitable for children, therefore discretion is advised. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Atif Dost. Today is 27th July 2024 and 21st Muharram 1446. The title is Cracking the Kaaba Code, Part 6, The History of the Kaaba. We have already covered the first three dot points of the session roadmap. In this session, I will cover the dot point number four, the contemporary history of the Kaaba. We will cover the history of Safa and Marwa in a separate video, God willing. In the following slides, I'll be presenting the scholarly historical record of the Kaaba. This record is produced by collective efforts of countless researchers, historians, religious leaders from Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Those who do not know may be wondering what does Judaism and Christianity has to do with Islam's number one holiest site. Well, this is because the historians tell us that the Kaaba existed long before traditional Islam. Special note. This video is not intended to hurt anyone's feelings or beliefs. Its sole purpose is to clearly explain the scholarly history of the Kaaba and compare it with what is recorded in the Quran. For this presentation, I have selected three scholars from different backgrounds. Reza Eslin converted to Evangelical Christianity from Shia Islam as a youth. Later, he reverted to Islam but continued to write about Christianity. He's a scholar of sociology of religion, a writer, an actor, and a television host. I'll be quoting from his article, No God But God, published in the New York Times. He has also authored a book with the same title. Dr. Abu Amina Bilal Phillips, short Dr. Bilal Phillips, converted to Islam from Christianity and communism. He's a teacher, a speaker, an author. He's also a founder and Chancellor of the International Open University. I'll be referring to his article, Hajj in Pre-Islamic Times, from the Arab News. And finally, Professor Rabbi Reuven Firestone. He is an academic, a historian of religion, who serves as the Regenstein Professor in Medieval Judaism and Islam at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religions. He is also an affiliate professor of Religion at the University of Southern California. I'll be quoting from his entry in Encyclopedia of the Quran titled Safa and Marwa in this presentation. Now it's time to revisit the history or the story of the Kaaba according to the scholars and compare it with the Quran. Origins of the Kaaba. Reza Eslin writes in the New York Times article, No God But God. Quote, the pagan Arabs gathered around the Kaaba believed their sanctuary to have been founded by Adam, the first man. They believed that Adam's original edifice was destroyed by the Great Flood, then rebuilt by Noah. They believed that after Noah, the Kaaba was forgotten for centuries until Abraham rediscovered it while visiting his firstborn son, Ismail, and his concubine, Hagar, both of whom had been banished to this wilderness at the behest of Abraham's wife, Sarah. End quote. Points. Adam founded the Kaaba, then rebuilt by Noah, and finally rediscovered by Abraham by chance or fluke. According to Reza Eslan, Abraham was unaware of the significance of the site in the desert where he banished his son and concubine. On his second visit, he had an epiphany that this is the location of the house of God, the Kaaba. Did God not tell him that? Has he stumbled upon a very significant site? The location of his house, the Kaaba, near Mount Safa and Marwa? Did God not give him the address of his house? Historically speaking, Abraham and Hagar rediscovered the Kaaba by fluke. Do you think the prophets of God operate on chances and flukes? Or their job is to read out the commands of God and demonstrate how to follow them. But as a reader of history, I get the impression that he had rediscovered the Kaaba by fluke. In contrast, let's see how Ibrahim salam, was shown the location of the house. Quran 22:26. 26. 
And when we pointed out for Ibrahim the place of the house, that you do not associate anything with me, and clean up my house for those circling around, and those standing and bowing, prostrating. Who pointed out the location of the house to Ibrahim alayhi salam? Allah himself pointed out for Ibrahim alayhi salam the location of the house, according to the Qur'an. And how was he shown the location of the Kaaba? I say by using the markers. And what are those markers? That the people are circling around my house, and they are standing and bowing, prostrating, making it a mosque, a masjid. This is the location of my house, but it needs cleaning. Let's assume Reza Aslan is correct, that there was no one around the Kaaba at the time of Ibrahim a.s. Then the following is not possible. Number one, remember Ibrahim a.s. was raised in a non-Muslim household. Therefore, he is out looking for the guidance. And this house has the guidance for the worlds. Refer to chapter 3, ayah 96. Number two. There is no way for Prophet Ibrahim to identify or spot or locate the place of the house because he is not given the GPS coordinates or the address of the house that is Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Mind you, at a God's time scale, the tectonic plates shift and the changes and that changes the GPS coordinates. The countries come and go. The world map changes. Number three. Also in the case of no rituals around the house, Ibrahim a.s. could not have connected the dots between the rituals and the acquired knowledge of astronomy. So the people were always there performing the rituals without knowing the science behind it, just like us. And when scholars and historians try to make sense of the rituals by looking into the history, this is what they have produced. Starting from the following question. What is the name of the first mosque ever established? If you answered Masjid Quba or Quba Mosque near Medina, chances are you're wrong. Because when I search which is the oldest mosque in the world, the answer is not Quba Mosque. The correct answer is Masjid Al Haram. Why? Because we just read in the previous slide that the people were establishing Salah standing bowing and prostrating at the time of Ibrahim a.s. And in the same verse, the house is mentioned al-bayt. Which house people were facing when Ibrahim a.s. was asked to clean up the house? They were facing the Kaaba. And the place where this kind of salah prayer is performed in congregation is called a masjid, translated mosque. Without a Kaaba, a mosque cannot be built or established. Therefore, the first, the oldest, and the only circular mosque in the world is Masjid al-Haram, the forbidden mosque. So what happens when I read the Qur'an's chapter 9, ayah 108? Surely a mosque founded from the first day on piety is more worthy that you should stand in it. In it are people who love to be clean. And Allah loves those who keep clean. So naturally, the forbidden mosque comes to my mind because it exists from the very first day before Ibrahim a.s. time. Who were the pagans? I've been told that before the time of Christianity and Judaism, the people were pagans. It sounds like the whole human population agreed and practiced the same religion, that is paganism. This scenario sounds too good to be true. Therefore, to know pagans, we need to understand their religion, the paganism. Again, Reza Aslan explains paganism in the same article, No God But God. It is true that before the rise of Islam, the Arabian Peninsula was dominated by paganism. But like Hinduism, paganism is a meaningless and somewhat derogatory catch-all term created by those outside the tradition to categorize what is in reality an almost unlimited variety of beliefs and practices. So paganism is not a religion. It is rather a collection of countless different beliefs and religions. 
So what do you think the people were called when Ibrahim salam and the generations before him performed the tawaf, circling around the Kaaba, and performed prayers, salah, that is standing, bowing, and prostrating? Who were they identified as by the historians? Of course, they call them the pagans in the history books, not Muslims. This is how the historians painted a utopian picture that all the humans were in consensus about their belief. This only happens in fairy tales and movies. The article continues. The word paganist means a rustic villager or a boor and was originally used by Christians as a term of abuse to describe those who followed any religion but theirs. In some ways, this is an appropriate designation. So the Christians in ancient times invented this term for all other religions and belief systems. Always remember, in Ibrahim salam's time, neither Christianity nor Judaism existed. In contrast, the Hajj pilgrimage existed, the Kaaba existed, Mount Safa and Marwa existed, the Tawaf circling around the Kaaba existed, and the Salah, the prayer, standing, bowing, and prostration existed. Muslims existed, and this means Islam existed as it exists in its current form. Because after all, we follow their religion. Hence, the Quran claims that this is the religion of your father Ibrahim. Quran twenty two seventy eight. What is the meaning of the word paganist and boar? Paganist means a rustic villager or a boar. And rustic means having a simplicity and charm that is considered typical of the countryside, lacking the sophistication of the city, backward and provincial, made in a plain and simple fashion. Boor means a rough and bad-mannered person. Note, although sounding similar, boor is different from boar, a tusked Eurasian wild pig. Do you think anyone would use a derogatory, derogatory term to describe their belief in God? Next time you hear that the whole ancient world was pagan in those days, take it with a grain of salt. Paganism was never a particular religion. It was a collection of many religions and belief systems other than Christianity. It was a catch-all term used by the Christians for non-Christian beliefs, and that includes Islam. Origins of Tawaf In the article, No God But God, Reza Eslin Rice, then in a remarkable ritual, the origins of which are a mystery. The pilgrims gather as a group and rotate around the Kaaba seven times. The ritual is so old that the origins are unknown. Why? Because this house was built by the first humans to worship the God of all, that is Allah. Dr. Bilal Phillips writes in the Arab News article, Hajj in Pre-Islamic Times. Hajj and his rites were first ordained by Allah in the time of Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him. However, with the passage of time, both the form and goal of Hajj rites were changed. The process of distortion reached its peak with the introduction of idols to the Kaaba. Points. For Reza Eslin, the origins of Tawaf are a mystery or unknown. And Dr. Bilal Phillips says the rituals of Tawaf was first ordained by Allah in the time of Ibrahim a.s. Neither of these two opinions are correct. Remember, these are just stories, like fairy tales. One scholar says one thing, another scholar has a different story, but neither, neither one is correct. Then what is the truth? Let's check the Quran. Where is the first house established? Indeed, the first house built or established for mankind is in Bakka, Mecca. It is blessed and has guidance for all the worlds. Quran 396. What was happening around the house of God when its location was pointed out to Ibrahim a.s.? And when we pointed out for Ibrahim the place of the house that you do not associate anything with me and clean up my house for those circling around and those standing 
and bowing, prostrating. Quran 22:26. Remember, the people were performing the tawaf that is circling around the Kaaba and performing salah that is standing, bowing, and prostrating. And in their footsteps, we are still doing the same. Who set up or configured the rituals of the Kaaba? Allah made the Kaaba the forbidden house, established for mankind, and the forbidden month, and the offering, and the necklaces, orbits, so that you may know that Allah knows what is in the skies and what is in the earth, and that Allah has the knowledge of everything. Quran 5.97 Allah made its rituals, and one of them is to form necklaces around the Kaaba by simulating the orbits of, or the, of the planets in our solar system. It is impossible for any human being to simulate our solar system without having its accurate knowledge. Yet these people are performing the rituals of, to simulate the solar system accurately with or without the knowledge of the solar system. If the smartest and well-educated people of the 21st century can go around the Kaaba seven times without knowing why, then what is the problem in believing that the ancient people could do the same? After all, we are following the rituals of their religion. The only reasonable explanation is Allah, the God, willed it to be like this, and unbeknown to us, we are miraculously doing His will with or without the knowledge since the ancient times. Prophets came and deciphered the ritual of Tawaf that is circling around the Kaaba by using the physical solar system to lead people to believe in the metaphysical realm that is Allah, the God. And that's how Ibrahim identified the one true God, Allah, out of many deities of his time. A note to the Western listener, the name Allah may sound foreign to you. Remember, Christianity and Judaism originated in the Middle East. And you may not be aware that, that an Arab Christian do not call Jesus God. Rather, Jesus is called Allah. And an Arab Jew also call his God Allah. So my suggestion is to get comfortable with the name Allah. Because it is the original, most common and preferred name of God known around the world. Idols around the Kaaba. The New York Times article, No God But God. In all, there are said to be 360 idols housed in and around the Kaaba, representing every God recognized in the Arabian Peninsula. Points. 360 idols are not mentioned in the Quran. The rituals of Salah, prayer, and Tawaf circling around the Kaaba were already in place and performed by the people when Ibrahim salam arrived in the Forbidden Mosque, Masjid al Haram. See Quran 22 26. These are just stories about the Kaaba, like made up tales. Can anyone place an idol now in or around the Kaaba? No, no one can. Why not? because it is impossible in the presence of hundreds, if not thousands of people circling the building 24-7 all year round, like the guards guarding a building. Then why do you think bringing the idols in or around the Kaaba was possible in the ancient times? Ask the scholars and imams, how was the first idol smuggled and placed inside or around the Kaaba while the people were circling the building day and night? Or do you think you are better educated and more informed about their religion, their history, and their rituals? Keep in mind, we are following their religion. We learned these rituals from them, passed down from generation to generation. What is Ibrahim salam's prayer for the city Mecca and the idols? Chapter 14, Ibrahim 35 and 36. And when Ibrahim said, Lord, make this city peaceful and keep me and my sons strangers from worshipping idols. Lord, 
they have indeed misled many people. So whoever follows me, then surely he is from me. And whoever disobeys me, then you are often forgiving, most merciful. Ibrahim salam asked Allah to keep him and his sons strangers from worshipping idols. And because of this prayer, Kaaba is still free from the idols to this day. Or are you suggesting this prayer of Ibrahim salam wasn't accepted? Mind you, he is a friend of Allah, the God. He's an imam, the leader for all mankind. God did not say it is the religion of Messenger Muhammad, peace be upon him. Rather, Islam is the religion of our father Ibrahim alayhi salam. See chapter 2278. He is the daddy of the religion Islam. Do you know why he is the father of the religion? Because without knowing the real God first, the revelation of Taurat is not possible because God, Allah, is the source of the divine revelation. Likewise, without knowing Allah first, Injil, Gospel, and the Quran cannot be revealed. So the correct order of revelation is this. Ibrahim salam identified the one true God, Allah, out of many man-made depictions of false gods. And he justified the existence of Allah. Then prophets came and believed in the same God of Ibrahim salam and received the revelation from Allah, the Tawrat, the Law, the Injil, the Gospel, and the Quran, the reading. Without knowing Allah, no revelation, no Nuzul, no Tawrat, no Injil, and no Quran to guide us. Out of those 360 idols in the Kaaba, these scholars are telling us the three goddesses, Allah, Al-Uzza and Manat were the most powerful one. In the article, No God But God, Reza Eslin writes, Though a powerful deity to swear by Allah's eminent status in the Arab pantheon rendered him like most high gods beyond the supplications of ordinary people, only in times of great peril would anyone bother consulting him. Otherwise, it was far more expedient to turn to the lesser, more accessible gods who acted as Allah's intercessors, the most powerful of whom were his three daughters, Allah, the goddess, Al-Uzza, the mighty, and Manat, the goddess of fate. Allah replies in chapter 53, verses 19 to 24, أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّةِ وَمَنَاتَ الثَّالِثَةَ الْأُخْرَى أَلَكُمُ الزَّكَرُوا وَلَهُ الْأُنْثَى تِلْكَ إِذَنْ قِسْمَةٌ غِيزَةٌ إِنْ هِيَ إِلَّا أَسْمَاءٌ سَمَّيْتُمُوهَا أَنْتُمْ وَآبَاؤُكُمْ مَا أَنْزَلَ اللَّهُ بِهَا مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِنْ يَتَّبِعُونَ إِلَّا الظَّنَّ وَمَا تَهْوَ الْأَنْفُسِ وَلَقَدْ جَاءَهُمْ مِنْ رَبِّهِمُ الْهُدَى أَمْ لِلْإِنْسَانِ مَا تَمَنَّى Have you seen Allah and Al-Uzza and the other Manat, the third one? What for you, the male, and for him? The female, is this division fair? These are nothing but names you have invented, you and your forefathers. Allah has sent down no authority for them. They follow nothing but conjecture and what their souls desire. And indeed, the guidance has come to them from their Lord. Or is it for humans whatever they wish? Allah, Manat, and Uzza. These are just invented names. No such idols ever existed. The names invented by us and our ancestors. These names are based on someone's figment of imagination, conjecture, concoction, stories, desires, and wishful thinking. No authority has Allah ever sent down to confirm that these idols ever existed in the history of the Kaaba. Now let's see what Reza Eslan has to say about these concocted stories. The question asked is, have you seen the three powerful goddesses? The answer is in the article, no God but God. Of course, these are just stories intended to convey what the Kaaba means, not where it came from. The truth is that no one knows who built the Kaaba or how long it has been here. I continue. 
Alas, as with so many things about the Kaaba, its origins are mere speculation. The only thing scholars can, tell, can say with any certainty is that by the 6th century CE, this small sanctuary made of mud and stone had become the center of religious life in pre-Islamic Arabia. These scholars know they are made of stories and based on speculation. One should not base their belief on stories and speculation. The Kaaba and its rituals are the core of the religion Islam from before Ibrahim al-Salam's time. Historically, it is a pre-Islamic house. A pre-Islamic prophet is the father of our religion, that is Ibrahim al-Salam. Islam did not start 1400 years ago. It is existing since the time human beings built the first house in Bekka. Our history doesn't have records from the time of first humans who built the Kaaba. Therefore, historians fail to find its origins. It is in continuation from Adam salam, Adam to Messenger Muhammad, peace be upon him. The scholarly history published in New York Times, CNN, BBC, Encyclopedia, or Arab News will do no good to you. The Kaaba is Allah's house, and only he can tell us its rightful history in the Quran. Origins of Tawaf, New York Times article, No God But God. It is also possible that the original sanctuary held some cosmological significance for the ancient Arabs. Not only were many of the idols in the Kaaba associated with the planets and stars, but the legend that they totaled 360 in number suggests some suggests astral connotations. The seven circumambulations of the Kaaba called Tawaf in Arabic and is still the primary ritual of the annual Hajj pilgrimage may have been intended to mimic the motion of the heavenly bodies. This also proves that I am not telling you anything new. Someone in the history knew that the circumambulations of the Kaaba are intended to mimic the motion of the solar system. And after rehashing the truth, we came to the same conclusion again. That is, the rituals in the house of God are based on our solar system. Points. At the time of this article in 2005, Pluto was considered the ninth planet. Its status was downgraded in August 2006. After the loss of ninth planet, Reza Eslin failed to connect the dots between the 21st century astronomy and the rituals in the Kaaba. Since the ancient times until today, Tawaf is the primary ritual of the pilgrimage around the Kaaba. Now resemblances between the solar system and the Tawaf. The Hajj major pilgrimage is performed in the 12th month of the Islamic year, when the earth is completing its own orbit around the sun. Our sun is in the center, the Kaaba is also in the center. Planets orbit in anti-clock direction, so does a pilgrim around the Kaaba. Planets form an elliptical path, so does a pilgrim around the Kaaba. Seven planets can be seen in the sky from the Earth, therefore a pilgrim orbits seven times around the Kaaba. Moreover, the Kaaba is a guarded building. Do you think an idol can be placed in the presence of the people? In continuation, Origins of Tawaf, Dr. Bilal Phillips writes in the article Hajj in Pre-Islamic Times. The religious rites of Tawaf circling of the Kaaba was reduced to a circus. Women and men went round and round the Kaaba performing Tawaf stark naked. Points to note, Dr. Bilal claiming that our forefathers or ancestors were performing Tawaf stark naked around the Kaaba. How does Allah command? There should be no obscenity, intimacy, foul language, and arguments during pilgrimage. Quran 2, 197. The common sense says, in the presence of hundreds of people, if not thousands, circling around the Kaaba 24-7 all year round, like the guards guarding a building, it is impossible to get naked without people noticing the person. However, Dr. Bilal Phillips claiming that our ancestors were circling the Kaaba completely naked. 
he must have a reason to make such a claim. Sex inside the Kaaba. Getting better slide after slide, isn't it? I seek refuge in Allah from this history. Professor Reuven Firestone writes under the title Safa and Marwa in the Encyclopedia of the Quran. In pre-Islamic times, pilgrims who were engaged in the running would touch two sacred stones erected on the two hills, images of the gods Isaf and Nila. The two stones were human lovers who had engaged in sexual intercourse in the sacred Kaaba, for which they were turned into stones. Points. Again, Professor Rabbi Reuven Firestone used this story to explain the ritual of Sa'i, walking and running between the two hills, Safa and Marwa. The story is foreign and not found in the Quran. This filth is infiltrating in our religion from the least expected and most trusted sources of information. The scholars, historians, researchers, religious leaders, and academics. They belong to the highest echelons of academia. Anyone can physically clean the house of God. However, cleaning up this scholarly filth is no job of a janitor or a bhangi. Allah does not send his mighty prophet just to mop the floor for you. However, to counter this obscene, filthy, scholarly narrative, he sends help. Therefore, Allah assigned the task to Ibrahim salam to clean up his house for the people. I have explained, Sa'i, the ritual of completing seven laps between Mount Safa and Marwa in the video Cracking the Kaaba Code, Safa and Marwa, Part 1 and 2 without using any obscenity and sex. Do you really think Allah would turn people into idols in his house where he has prohibited the idols himself? If your answer is yes, you need to go get some common sense. Also, the common sense says, in the presence of hundreds of people, if not thousands, circling around the Kaaba continuously, like the guards guarding a building, it is impossible to introduce the idols or engage in sex inside the Kaaba. This was a comprehensive list of the historical events attributed to the Kaaba. Now I would like to summarize these events in 10 points. Number one. The pagan Arabs gathered around the Kaaba believed their sanctuary to have been founded by Adam, destroyed by the Great Flood, then rebuilt by Noah. Then the site was forgotten until Abraham rediscovered it by fluke. Number two, which is the first mosque ever built? You believe Koba Mosque is the first mosque. However, the oldest mosque is the Forbidden Mosque, Masjid al-Haram. Doesn't come to your mind. How come the first mosque is not the oldest mosque? Number three, then in a remarkable ritual, the origins of which are a mystery, the pilgrims gather as a group and rotate around the Kaaba seven times. Now the ritual of Tawaf is a mystery. Number four, Hajj and its, and its rites were first ordained by Allah in the time of Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him. Then 360 idols were brought into the Kaaba representing every god recognized in the Arabian Peninsula. None of our ancestors circling the Kaaba at the time had a hissy fit about it. However, if anyone brings an idol in the Forbidden Mosque, you will have a biggest hissy fit about it. Number five, out of those 360 idols, three idols were the most powerful one. The three daughters of Allah, Allah, the goddess, Al-Uzza, the mighty, and Manat, the goddess of fate. Number six, as with so many things about the Kaaba, the origins are mere speculation, these scholars claim. Number seven, the seven circumambulation circling around the Kaaba called Tawaf may have been intended to mimic the motion of the heavenly bodies, completely different story, but there is some truth to it, which our scholars don't want to investigate. Number eight, the religious rites of Tawaf circling of the Kaaba was performed completely naked by the women and men, and ancestors didn't do anything about it. But if someone gets naked now, you will have a dummy spit. Number nine, the two stones idols were human lovers who had engaged in sexual intercourse inside the Kaaba. Did not bother our ancestors, but you will have a big tantrum about it. What is all this nonsense? 
Why are these stories changing all the time? None of this nonsense is found in the Quran. And do you believe our ancestors were all idiots and you are a smart bunch? The real truth is in Reza Eslan's following admission. Number 10. Reza Eslan admits, Of course, these are just stories. The truth is that no one knows who built the Kaaba or how long it has been here. However, I am sure, like Dr. Bilal Phillips, Professor Rabbi Reuven Firestone has a reason to make such an obscene claim. So let's find out the reason behind these claims. Why scholars claim people were naked in the Kaaba? On this slide, I have quoted two translations. The first one by Dr. Thomas B. Irving and the other by Muhammad Taki Uddin Al-Hilali and Muhammad Mohsin Khan to show how scholars justify the filth from the Quran. Chapter 7, Al-Araf, verse 28. Translation 1. Whenever they perform any obscene act, circumambulating the Kaaba naked, they say, we found out our forefathers were performing it, and Allah, God, has ordered us to do so. Say, Allah, God, does not order any misconduct. Do you say something you do not know about Allah, God? Translation 2. And when they commit a fahisha, evil deed, going around the Kaaba in naked state and every kind of unlawful sexual intercourse, they say we found our fathers doing it and Allah has commanded it on us. Say, nay, Allah never commands fahisha. Do you say of Allah what you know not? Probably Dr. Bilal Phillips and Professor Rabbi Reuven Firestone are also in agreement with the translators. I am sure any scholar who believes in this field will not hesitate to quote this verse. To answer them, you need to understand the use of the brackets first. The Arabic Quran does not have brackets or braces. You will notice them in the translations of the Quran. Brackets are used for many reasons, but I am listing only two reasons that are relevant to our topic. Number one, sometimes translators use brackets to translate an Arabic word to English. For instance, Dr. Thomas B. Irving translated the word Allah in brackets as God, marked in blue. That's not a problem. However, in the other instances where the brackets are in red color, all three translators inserted their interpretation or their understanding of the word fahisha, which simply means obscene in English. In the translation number two, the word fahisha is not translated, and both the Muhammads conveniently inserted their interpretation, understanding, between the brackets. In contrast, in the translation number one, the word Faisha is translated as obscene, yet the brackets remain in place and contains the interpretation or understanding of, or, of the translation, translators. Dr. Irving says, circumambulating the Kaaba naked only, whereas the two Muhammads says, going round the Kaaba in naked state and all kinds of unlawful sexual intercourse. To be very clear, the red brackets or braces mean the contents inside are not present in the original Arabic text. It is not part of the Quran. The Quran simply says, when they commit obscenity, they say, we found our forefathers doing it. That's all. The problem gets bigger for the scholars and translators because the God negates these interpretations in the same verse by commanding the reader to say, tell them, counter them, that Allah never commands with obscenity. Or are you saying things about Allah which you do not know? My point here is, if you are reading brackets in the translation, you may not be reading the Quran. In fact, you are reading someone's opinion about the Quran. Also note, Obscenity can range from publicizing nude stories to pornography and all in between. For instance, telling nude stories about the Kaaba is committing obscenity, Faisha. 
especially amongst the believers. You may be wondering who said that. Let's find out. Is it okay to spread obscenity? The answer is in chapter 24, An-Nur, verse 19. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُحِبُّونَ أَن تَشِيعَ الْفَاحِشَةُ فِي الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Indeed, those who love to spread obscenity among the believers will suffer a painful punishment in this life and the hereafter. And Allah knows and you do not know. This is a guiding principle of life for a righteous person. And since we hold our scholars and learned people in the highest esteem, they must not spread obscenity amongst the believers, let alone spreading obscene stories about the people circling the Kaaba. Later in this video, you will learn the clothing of the consciousness is in the verses of Allah. And this is a prime example of how to dress up your consciousness. This is the reason I do not read the nakedness between the brackets. How do I read the translation? Translation 1. When they perform any obscene act, they say, We found out our forefathers were performing it, and Allah has ordered us to do so. Say, Allah does not order any misconduct. Do you say something you do not know about Allah? Translation 2. And when they commit a faisha, they say, We found our fathers doing it, and Allah has commanded it on us. Say, Nay, Allah never commands faisha. Do you say of Allah what you know not? The contents inside the brackets are not part of the Quran. Therefore, when I read the Quran, I simply ignore the brackets because my intention is to find out what is in the Quran rather than the translator's opinion about it. But then how do you make sense of the verse? What does it mean? First, I don't have to have an explanation for every ayah like an all-knowing scholar. All-knowing is only, only God. And having good questions in mind is a healthy diet for the thoughts. In my opinion, the second translation is a bad example for an English-only reader. Because Faisha is an Arabic word and it is transliterated rather than translated. Therefore, the reader is lost in translation. The takeaway point is, Allah never commands with obscenity. Then the question is, who does? I think it's time to look at the context of this text to make sense of the verse. This slide will not only answer who commands with obscenity, but it also details the context of chapter 7, Al-Araf, verse 28. In it, you will see where this nude incident took place. The story's full context starts from chapter 7, verse 11. 7, 11. However, to keep it short, I'll pick up the story from verse 26. Ya Bani Adama qad anzalna alaykum libasan yubari sawatikum wa risha wa libasu taqwa thalika khair thalika min ayatillahi la'allahum yazzakkaroon. O children of Adam, we have bestowed upon you clothing to conceal your shame and as an adornment and clothing of the consciousness that is best. That is, from the verses, signs, ayat of Allah, so that they may, re re may remember. Points. There are two types of clothing mentioned. One is used to cover our bodies and to adorn ourselves. Therefore, we have a multi-billion dollar designer clothing industry. The second type of clothing is in our consciousness, awareness, and that is considered the best. And where is it found? That is in the verses of Allah, or signs, ayat of Allah. When a person memorizes these verses and lives by them, his her consciousness is covered, dressed up, otherwise the thoughts in our mind are stark naked, and they reflect in our speech in the form of swear words, lewd jokes, and naked stories like the ones these scholars are telling us. The, there is a third type of garment or clothing mentioned in the Quran. The verse is a little long, therefore I'll quote only parts relevant to our topic. Chapter 2, Al-Baqarah, verse 187. Given at the bottom, I quote, Permitted to you on the night of the fasts is the approach to your women. They are your clothing and you are their clothing. End quote. The second quote, But do not have intimacy with them while you are in retreat in the mosques during the etikaf. 
These are Allah's limits, so do not go near them. End quote. So two points to note. Men and women in a relationship are a garment or a clothing or a covering for each other. However, during a retreat in the mosques, intimacy is not permitted, including in the forbidden mosque, Masjid al-Haram. What were the scholars telling us? Every kind of unlawful sexual intercourse took place inside the Kaaba. Forget about unlawful sexual activity. Allah's, Allah doesn't permit lawful sexual intimacy with your spouse inside the mosque's masajid. Coming back to the context, chapter 7, verse 27. يَا بَنِي آدَمَ لَا يَفْتِنَنَّكُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ كَمَا أَخْرَجَ بَوَيْكُمْ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ يَنْزِعُ عَنْهُمَا لِبَاسَهُمَا لِيُرِيَّهُمَا سَوْآتِهِمَا إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا الشَّيَاطِينَ أَوْلِيَاءَ لِلَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ O oh, children of Adam, do not let Satan tempt you like he t- turned your two fathers and sisters, forefathers, out of the paradise, stripping from them their clothes to show them their shame. Indeed, he watched you, him and his tribe, from where you do not see them. We have made Satan's protectors for those who do not believe. Now what Satan managed to do is strip the clothing from the two ancestors' forefathers, that is physically, physical garments and the garment of the consciousness or awareness, that is in the ayats, ayat or verses. And this is how Satan commands. And where were our forefathers when this incident took place? They were in the paradise, not in the forbidden mosque or near the Kaaba. This is the actual context of the verse 28 of chapter 7, which is next. وَإِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً قَالُوا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهَا آبَاءَنَا وَاللَّهُ أَمَرَنَا بِهَا قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَأْمُرُ بِالْفَحْشَاءِ أَتَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And when they do obscenity, they say we found our forefathers on it. And Allah commanded us with it. Say, indeed, Allah does not command with obscenity. Do you say about Allah what you do not know? Whenever they do obscenity, they say our forefathers did it. Adam and his partner did it. Therefore, I am bound to do it because I have inherited the original sin from Adam. Basically, blaming God that he made us inherit the original sin. The God could not forgive and forget. This is a Christian belief. In Islam, every child born is innocent. Because the verse 28 starts from the words, when they do obscenity, it simply means whenever someone will do obscenity, meaning 2,000 years ago, now or in the future, will blame his ancestors and God. For example, when a scholar of religion attempts to explain the origin of tawaf, ritual of circling around the Kaaba, the first thing they do is commit obscenity by telling the people the naked story or history that our ancestors, forefathers were performing tawaf start naked. And we are performing the same ritual in continuation. However, when questioned, why are you following these stark naked people? The scholar will reply, we are not performing tawaf because of them. We are performing this ritual because Allah has commanded us to do it. Same blame, our ancestors were stark naked and Allah has commanded us to do it. The most important thing to remember is the context in the Quran is referring to Adam salam, in the paradise. He is not in the forbidden mosque or inside the Kaaba. And the message for us is not to commit obscenity by spreading nude stories. Or if anyone uses the excuses that the two ancestors in the heaven did not did did obscenity and they were forgiven, therefore we can do the same. Allah told them not to do it, 
and he is informing us not to repeat it. Same rule for all of us, nothing changed. On the contrary, the filthy history is coming from the least expected yet most trusted source of information, the academia. This information is trickling down from the highest echelons of religion and academia, and I don't think any one of us would suspect the Satan devil operating out of academia or the religion itself. This is the reason Allah, Allah says, the Satan and his tribe sees you from where you do not see them. Only Allah exposes the devil. If you know his book, otherwise, unbeknown to our scholars, they are playing right in the devil's hands. Ironically, in the same verse, Allah commands the reader to say, answer them, tell them, contradict them, counter them, that Allah does not command with obscenity. Or do you say about Allah what you do not know? Is this statement not clear enough for the scholars? Or have they missed the context completely? Or are they attempting to do corruption tarif in the Quran by changing the context completely? Our tawaf has nothing to do with, our, with your naked stories and history. Now you may, be, you may have a valid objection that I have conveniently accepted the information from the same academia on, on astronomy but rejected the history of the religion. Isn't that a contradiction? I'll sum it up in two points. Point number one, the right and the wrong is everywhere, including in the academia. They are not exempt from the constructive criticism and scrutiny. I have presented the context from the Quran and compared it with the naked history presented by the scholars. Point number two, because the scholars of religion have made a mistake, I do not use a blanket rule to reject all the scholarly knowledge. So the question is, how do I pick and choose the right from the wrong? What is my criterion? My criterion is the Quran. It confirmed the post-2006 information on astronomy. However, it rejected the absurd, obscene, made-up story, history about the Tawaf and the Kaaba. This was only made possible because the Qur'an is also known as the criterion, the Furqan. It identifies the right from the wrong for our guidance. Now we know how Satan commands, that is with obscenity, and Allah does not command with obscenity. So how does Allah command? The context continues, verse 29. قُلْ أَمَرَ رَبِّي بِالْقِسْتِ وَأَقِيمُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ عِنْدَ كُلِّ مَسْجِدٍ وَدُعُوهُ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينِ Again, Allah commanded the reader to say, answer them, tell them, counter them, say, my Lord commands with justice and in installments, and, uh, and establish your faces near every mosque and invoke him, making the judgment purely for him. Just as you were originated, so shall you be repeated. So how are we keeping the judgment or religion pure for him in the mosques? This is possible because during the prayers in the mosque, an imam, the person leading the prayer, must only recite the Qur'an in Arabic from his memory without making a mistake. And when he does make a mistake, the people standing behind him call out the mistake loudly, clearly, and repeatedly until he corrects his mistake. He cannot and must not tell history or naked stories or his interpretations or ideas or philosophies during during the prayer. Therefore, Muslims are just as comfortable going to a mosque in Australia, China, India, Asia, Europe, Africa, and Americas as they are in Arabia. This is how Quran is protected from a change or corruption. The people standing behind the person leading the prayer are keeping a check on what the Imam utters. فَرِيقًا هَدَايَا وَفَرِيقًا حَقَّا لَيْهِمُ الضُّلَالَ إِنَّهُمُ اتَّخَذُوا الشَّيَاطِينَ أَوْلِيَاءَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَيَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ A group is guided and another group truthfully went astray. They have taken Satans as their guardians instead of Allah, while they calculate that they are guided. The last verse is quite amazing. There are two groups. One is guided and the other went astray. People gone astray think that they are the guided ones. Most people in the world think they are right. 
However, the rightly guided group asks for guidance 17 times in five daily prayers because they know there is always room for improvement. Hence, they're asking for more guidance. Now, after knowing all this, you may be wondering how come our learned scholars have missed the mark by a mile. This is made possible because they believe in the history over the Quran. For example, in this particular instance, they ignored the context given in the Quran of chapter 7, ayah 28, and replaced it with the naked historical record. This is a form of corruption or tahrif. How is our history recorded? Generally, we are very comfortable living in our time bubble of 2,024 years and counting. This means our written history consists of 2,024 years. And that history is recorded using the Gregorian calendar, which is currently a global standard. It is understood that Gregorian calendar started counting the days from the birth of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. The Gregorian calendar or the history is divided into two timelines. That is Anno Domini or AD era and before Christ or BC era. So what is AD or Anno Domini? A.D. or Anno Domini is the Latin term for in the year of the Lord, where Lord refers to Jesus Christ. He was born in the year Anno Domini 1 or A.D. 1, and we are currently in the year 2024 Anno Domini. This means 2,024 years have passed since the birth of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Now you may be thinking Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, must be born on the 1st of January, year AD 1, right? Because the Gregorian calendar started from his birth. Wrong. The count started almost 12 months before Jesus Christ's birth, peace be upon him. He wasn't even conceived on the 1st of January, AD 1. In fact, he hardly made it in the first year of the Gregorian calendar. He was born on the 25th of December, year 81, as per Christian belief. So 1st of January, year 0001 AD, is an arbitrary number. Simply put, it is a random day they picked as the start of the year. In contrast to the 2,024 years of written history, the humans have been living on the planet Earth anywhere from 190,000 years to 300,000 years. This is only based on the evidence currently available. In the future, the number may change. For your information, the Aboriginals in Australia claim that they have been living here for 65,000 years. The other timeline is called BC or before Christ. As the name implies, BC or before Christ simply means the time before the birth of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. The Christians believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was born on the 25th December, year AD 1. However, the BC timeline strictly refers to the time before 1st of January, year AD 1. The logical fallacy in this is, although the time between January 1 to December 24, year AD 1, is also before the birth of Jesus Christ, but it is part of Anno Domini calendar. The other anomaly of the BC calendar is, while the arrow of time always moves forward from present to the future, the BC calendar years are counted backwards from the future to the past. For example, the year BC1 is in the future, then year BC2. The higher the BC year, the further back in time we go. Do you think ancient people were counting the time backwards? I think not. This is only done by our scholars and historians to make things easier for us to understand. And that is exactly my point. Our scholars and historians in the common era are writing stories about the people in the ancient times. The problem is about to get far worse because according to the scholars, and I quote, it is widely accepted that the actual birth of Jesus occurred at least two years before AD 1. And so some argue that explicitly linking years to an erroneous birth date 
for Jesus is arbitrary or even misleading, end quote. This quote is taken from a blog post on antidote.info website. Some of us may question the reliability of this blog. Therefore, let's hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Christianity.com is the website. The heading is, What Year Was Jesus Born? While many scholars believe Jesus was born sometime between 4 BC and 6 BC, there is no definitive historical evidence that pinpoints the exact year of his birth. The commonly used Christian calendar, which designates Jesus' birth as the starting point, traditionally place it at 1 BC or 1 AD, although these dates are approximate and may not align precisely with historical records. What this passage means is Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not even born in the year AD 1, as Christians are made to believe. On the contrary, the Christ was born between year 4 BC and 6 BC according to the scholars. At year AD 1, this means Jesus Christ was five to seven year old boy on his first birthday on the 25th of December, year AD 1. So Jesus Christ was born before Christ by four to six BC years. This doesn't make sense, but such is our history. Anyways, because of these errors and discrepancies, in the AD and the BC timelines of Christian Gregorian calendar, non-Christian groups and science and academia decided to distance themselves from the terms Anno Domini, AD and before Christ, BC, and replace them with an arbitrary times or time bubbles called CE, Common Era, and BCE, before Common Era. Does it mean we shouldn't count the time? Not at all. Keeping a count of days, months, and years is not a problem because the time is relative. Its purpose should be to serve the humans. For instance, time-bound business contracts. On the contrary, God and, and his book, the Quran, are timeless. Do not confine it to 1,400 years, 2,000 years, 5,000, or 10,000 years. Is Quran a book of history and how some people react when they hear the Quran? Chapter 8, Al Anfal, verses 31 to 33. And when our signs are recited on them, they say, We have heard. If we wished, we could say similar to this. These are nothing but tales of the former peoples. So they are saying, we have heard this, and we could tell similar stories if we wished. What similar stories? That once upon a time in history, people were going around the Kaaba stark naked and having sexual intercourse inside the Kaaba. And we believe this is our history written in the Quran. On the contrary, the Qur'an is asking to cover and adorn ourselves physically and mentally. They are also claiming that these are just stories or history of the ancient peoples. I would beg to differ. This is not a book of once upon a time story or history. The contents recorded in the Qur'an are repeatable and reproducible. For instance, Ibrahim was asked to clean up the house of God for the people. And now I am trying to clean up the house of God for the people by following Ibrahim salam's example. Using the same Kaaba, same Mount Safa and Marwa, same forbidden mosque, same solar system, and the knowledge of gravity and astronomy which is acquired from the creation of Allah. Humans have acquired this knowledge from observing his creation and how it is operating. And thousands of years later, someone else will come and repeat the process again. Therefore, it is not a book of once upon a time in history. Rather, it is a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S, for us to follow and guide ourselves. 
وَإِذْ قَالُوا اللَّهُمَّ إِنْ كَانَ هَذَا هُوَ الْحَقَّ مِنْ عِنْدِكَ فَأَمْطِرْ عَلَيْنَا حِجَارَةً مِنَ السَّمَاءِ أَوْ ائْتِنَا بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ And when they say, O oh Allah, if this is indeed the truth from you, rain down on us a shower of stones from the sky, or send us a painful punishment. Furthermore, they say, if this is really the truth from you, O Lord, that all our naked history is wrong, then stone us from the sky indiscriminately. Send upon us a meteorite or asteroid shower. Do you know why they were in such a shock about the truth when it was presented to them? Because they believed in their own history and the worldview, just like us. How is it possible that our history could be wrong? The scholars have been molding the Quran to fit into the naked historical narrative rather than judging the history from the Quran. They read the Quran through their historical lens. In the next verse, Allah explains why he is not punishing indiscriminately. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ And Allah would not punish them while you are in them, nor will He punish them while they are seeking forgiveness. So Allah will not stone us with a meteor shower until you are reciting His messages with truth and until they are until these people are seeking his forgiveness. He is all forgiving and merciful. No blood sacrifice needed of an animal or a human or a God incarnate. But does it mean these people are getting away scot-free? Since they demanded to be punished, Allah answers chapter 8, Al-Anfal 34 and 35 in continuation. وَمَا لَهُمْ أَلَّا يُعَذِّبَهُمُ اللَّهُ وَهُمْ يَصُدُّونَ عَنِ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ وَمَا كَانُوا أَوْلِيَاءَ إِنْ أَوْلِيَاءُهُ إِلَّا الْمُتَّقُونَ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And what is for them that Allah should not punish them? And they are a hindrance from the forbidden mosque. And they are not as guardians. None can be as guardians except the righteous but most of them do not know. So why they are a hindrance? Because of their naked, sexualized stories about the forbidden mosque and the Kaaba. Who in their right mind can justify those stories? And do they think they are the guardians of the forbidden mosque? Who are these people? I would like to know. وَمَا كَانَ صَلَاتُهُمْ عِنْدَ الْبَيْتِ إِلَّا مُكَاءً وَتَصْدِيَةً فَذُوقُ الْعَذَابَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْفُرُونَ Their salat, prayer near the house, is nothing but whistling and clapping. So taste the punishment for your rejection. Can you believe it? They are praying near the house, Kaaba. Their salat, prayers, worship, Five times a day is considered nothing but whistling and clapping in the sight of Allah. It does not mean that people were literally whistling, clapping and dancing in nude in the forbidden mosque. It simply means their lifetime of prayers and worship is in vain. Do you know why? Because of the lip service. They are reciting the verses, ayat and bowing, prostrating on them, admitting that it is the truth from their Lord. However, their actual belief is in the man-made history books, start naked tawaf, sexual intercourses, in the Kaaba. So their recitation of the Qur'an means nothing more than a waste of a breath, or worse, whistling and clapping. Let's identify these people by their personality traits. Number one. When ayat verses are recited to them, they say, we have heard them. Who heard the verses of the Qur'an? Number two, they ask Allah for punishment, so they know Allah very well. 
Number three, they think the ayat verses are stories of the ancient times, meaning they don't apply the messages in the verses to themselves. Everything is once upon a time. It happened 1,400 years ago or 2,000 years ago in the history. These are not bedtime stories to put you to sleep. Number four, they are not the guardians, protectors of the forbidden mosque, as they, as they like to think. Do you know why? Because the rituals of the Kaaba doesn't make sense to them without the nudity and sexualized filth. Number five, they are also establishing Salat prayer near the house five times a day. And how are they a problem for the forbidden mosque? Number six, their naked sexualized history about the rituals in the house of God is a hindrance or a hurdle for the forbidden mosque for others to believe in it. And it cannot be defended in a logical discourse. Yet they are sure their naked history is true and cannot be wrong. Who are these people? They are scholars, theologians, and historians of religion. They tell the people the filthy and immoral history justified in the name of God. Remember, earlier we, re we read that the Satan is watching you from where you do not see him and his tribe. And also memorize this principle of God. He never commands with obscenity. The choices are very clear. Either you keep on believing the scholarly mindless nude history, or you can believe in the rituals of the house of God as a simulation of our solar system. The former choice cannot be defended in a logical discourse, whereas the latter choice is clean, educational, and righteous. And that's why the righteous are the guardians of the forbidden mosque because they can back up their belief from the Qur'an and using the creation of the solar system. Breaking news for you. أَلَمْ يَأْتِكُمْ نَبَأُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ قَوْمِ نُوحٍ وَعَادٍ وَثَمُودٍ وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ لَا يَعْلَمُهُمْ إِلَّا اللَّهِ جَاءَتْهُمْ رُسُلُهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ فَرَدُّوا أَيْدِيَهُمْ فِي أَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَقَالُوا إِنَّا كَفَرْنَا بِمَا أُرْسِلْتُمْ بِهِ وَإِنَّا لَفِي شَكٍّ مِّمَّا تَدْعُونَنَا إِلَيْهِ مُرِيبٍ Has not the news come to you of those before you, the people of Nuh, Noah, and Ad, and Samud, and those after them. No one knows them except Allah. Their messengers came to them with clear irrefutable proofs. But they put their hands over their mouths and said, We totally reject what you have been sent with. And we are certainly in alarming doubt about what you are inviting us to. Why such a shock reaction? Do you know why? Because like you, they believed in their history. Like you, they believed in their worldview. And when that history and the worldview is proven wrong by the irrefutable clear proofs, they are stunned with their hands on their mouths. They are left speechless. The, th the truth is so unbelievable that they end up rejecting it. In closing, who can clean up the filthy scholarly narrative about the Kaaba and its rituals? A cleaner or a prophet? Only a prophet can clean such a mess by explaining the ayat versus the rituals and the functioning of our solar system. This is the reason Allah asked or tasked Ibrahim salam to clean up the house for the people. And God preserved this process in his timeless book, the Quran for the future generations to learn, understand, believe, and then clean up the house just like Ibrahim salam did. History repeats and the process never stops. This is how one can follow the practice of Ibrahim salam, Sunnat Ibrahimi. One may ask why ancient people did not spread the true knowledge and understanding of the Kaaba and its rituals when the prophets explained it. 
The answer is simple. Over a period of time, hard land knowledge erodes, and it is easily replaced by the obscene, sexualized, entertaining stories rather than learning the Book of God and undertaking a university-level degree in gravity and astronomy to explain the rituals. Over a long period of time, people will forget the real message again, and the process will repeat. And lastly, I would like to ask a question to the Muslims. On the Day of Judgment, are you going to say Messenger Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born in the 6th century A.D. Anno Domini, in the year of the Lord? Are you going to say that in the presence of Allah? Think about it. These are the references in the order of the slides. The web links are all valid at the time of this video. Thank you for your time. Assalamu alaikum.